call the meeting to order. Um, and I'll begin by reading our official statement that meetings normally held at the municipal offices are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation required in accordance with the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Meetings are typically broadcast on Frontier Community Access Television. I imagine, oops, I'm supposed to say got it. Yes, it's okay. I, I'm here. Everybody got it. Um, and I imagine that's happening tonight. And if anyone needs the remote meeting connection ID and passcode, they can find it at deerfieldma.us. Is that it, Alex? What's our, I don't know by now. At the, at the town, yep. yeah, right agenda at uh, the town website. <clears throat> um, so the meeting is called to order with a reminder to planning board um, members that we have our own internal guidelines to speak one at a time, recognized by the chair. We <laughs> want to follow the Deerfield Code of Conduct by being respectful, considerate, courteous, and also it's good to be concise and non-repetitive just for the fun of it. Um, Board members in attendance. Denise Mason? Here. <clears throat> Andrea Lipson? <clears throat> Somewhere. I know Andrew's here. And here, here, here. here. Go. <laughs> Kathy here. Sylvester? Here. Um, Kathy Wachroba? Here. Kathy yes. Rachel Blaine? Here. And Anne Mary Cloutier is not here with a, an, an urgent SOS. Is there someone who can? Um, Pitch in and help with the minutes. Um, we're luckily being recorded, so that makes it much easier, and I can sort of fill in the blanks. But is there something? I'll do it. I'll do it. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Kudos. All right. You, um, uh, so we did circulate minutes from our September 30th meeting. Uh, were there any <clears throat> corrections to those? No. Don't see any. All right. So if I could have a motion to approve those minutes. Can I just make Oh yes, Kathy. So um through the notes they they talk about attorney Mead and she clarifies language, but then they go down and it says attorney with no no name, like there's no indicator of who the attorney is. And maybe if we just had oh that person because they were in opposition of um Ha, does not want the law changed will negatively impact so it was judith rathborn's neighbor um right so right. Maybe, that's a good that's a good point kathy so maybe if we were to say um just what his name attorney for resident judith rathborn is that okay yeah, yeah. okay I, yeah rachel no, i no? think we need his name yeah i think we need his name i don't think it should be yeah because okay. he's not a resident yes i'll bet we can see that on um Mm -hmm. you know on that fcap thing so uh you know <laughs> if he, mm. okay or and he identified himself so yep that's a good point that's mm -hmm. a good point thank you so we will are there any other um suggested changes to the minutes no oh, okay good catch kathy uh so can we have a motion to approve the minutes i move that we approve the minutes as uh amended I second that. Denise Thank Mason. you. So that's uh, Andrew Leibson moving and Denise Mason seconding. Um, any more discussion on that? Okay. Um, I guess uh, all those in favor, uh, uh, Denise Mason? With the, with the amendment. With okay. the amendment. With yes. The amendment. <clears throat> right. Denise Mason? Yes. Andrea Leibson? Andrea Leibson, yes. Kathy Sylvester? Yes. Kathy Wotroba? Yes. And Rachel Blaine? Yes. Emily Wolf Cool, yes. So the minutes are approved as amended or as amended in the future. All right. So we'll move right on to new business. And we are honored to have Linda Dunlevy, the executive director of the FERC Hog, with us tonight. Um, Linda, as you know, we asked you to come as, um, I mean, first of all, some of us are newer than others on the planning board, but also. Uh, FERC Oak has lots of things going and evolving. And so um, if you can, I think to some degree, give us an over overview of FERC activities, especially with the bent towards planning, 
Um, and then also we have our have Q and A afterwards. So that that would be helpful. Thank you, Linda. Great. Yes, thank you. Um, I did create a PowerPoint so I can just roll through everything Excellent. we do and did try to focus it on things you might be particularly interested in. And in December, you'll be visited by Peggy Sloan and Alyssa LaRose from the COG. They work for our planning department. So I'm going to gloss over what planning does so as not to waste your time this month or next month. <laughs> and nice to see many of you are familiar faces. Nice to see you. So, okay, if I share my screen? Please. Okay. Uh, Alex, <laughs> yes. Can you see it? Looks mm -hmm. good. Yay. Yeah, that's always so exciting. <laughs> um, does this take the whole screen up? Do, is it now doing the slideshow? Well, we can see no. on the left hand column, we can see the Ooh, now. Oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. So, so here is our mission. Our mission is to provide our member towns in the region with quality professional service and advocacy. This is a very old picture of the COG staff. So if any of you are familiar with the COG, you'll say, she doesn't work here anymore. She doesn't work here anymore. And you're right, we need to update our picture. Plus, this picture is actually two pictures that we melded together. And so it's, a, it's like a little puzzle. So when people look distorted, it's because they are. <laughs> so our total funding in FY21 was 12 million. That was a particularly high year, partially because of COVID, mostly because we were transitioning to the state's emergency communication system, which resulted in a $3 million grant of equipment, radios, and portables for all of the first responders in Franklin County. Um, all 26 towns of Franklin County, I assume you know that in 1997, we were the county government. Governor Weld was intent on eliminating county government. We voluntarily abolished ourselves in hopes of getting a better deal. We really didn't, but we became a council of governments, which now means we're a voluntary membership organization and all of the towns pay a membership fee and get services for that fee. So our membership fee is based on a formula of EQV, equalized value in a town and population, and total for all 26 towns was $500,000-ish in FY21, and then $28,000 of a statutory assessment that pays for former county retiree health insurance. Um, and you can see our approximate breakdown of funding, which was about 4% was the regional services assessment and 56% grants. Here's a list of all of our programs. I'm just going to skip right over that. Um, we are, the administration and special projects are funded um, mostly by our membership assessment and indirect revenue we get from our grants. And we do a lot of special projects that don't have an um, otherwise identified funding source um, or will be at the beginning of a project while we're trying to figure out uh, whether to pursue it or not. Things that you would be interested in is that we use, um, we use a special grant funding called district local, district local technical assistance to put together municipal official workshops every year. This is a list of the workshops. Some of you may have gone to a few of them. We just did a short-term residential rental workshop, uh, COVID, COVID vaccine, OSHA compliance. We always, every year, do a select board 101 and a finance committee 101. We um, always work with the Citizen Planner Training Collaborative to do some specific workshops for planning boards. And up next in November, I believe November 17th, is ARPA spending and reporting. We pay for this using a grant called DLTA, like I mentioned. Um, DLTA, you all should keep an eye out for that. We will do the solicitation for projects into the December, January timeframe. And it's where we spend 
a fair amount of money doing traditional planning projects for um, our towns at their request. We also run a bunch of municipal service programs, and these are treated as enterprise funds within the Council of Governments, which means that they are expected to bring in the revenue needed to cover their expense if they exceed their revenue goals, that extra money stays in their pot so that they are self, they're like small businesses in our organization. The ones that Deerfield participates in is collective purchasing. We do uh, collective purchasing of highway products and services, fuel and elevator maintenance. Those are the three bids Deerfield uh, takes part with. We also provide procurement services to all the towns because state procurement law continues to get more and more complex. Our cooperative public health service is our, basically our county health district. We now have 16 towns in it. Deerfield is a member of the public health nursing. So our nursing program did all of your contact tracing throughout COVID held a couple of flu clinics recently, does senior elder care services, et cetera. And then this is pictures. Um, cooperative inspection program is our building wiring and plumbing inspection program. We provide services to 16 towns. Deerfield is not a member of our inspection program. You are also not a member of our town accounting program where we provide municipal accounting to 12 communities. And then we have regional grant funded programs and I'll fly through them. Um, the CHIP, I didn't know it would do that. The CHIP is the Community Health Improvement Plan and it basically looks at, it analyzes health information in Franklin County and tries to create a plan working with several partners to improve the health outcomes of all people in Franklin County. And an example of that is that we got received a grant called Improving Housing to Improve Health. And it's working with all of the communities um, to look at how we can develop more housing in Franklin County. We need more housing in Franklin County, um, not only to uh, serve our existing residents, but hopefully to encourage more people to move to Franklin County because our declining and aging population is, in my opinion, the greatest risk to Franklin County's future. Uh, we have a grant funded emergency preparedness program where we do some things that are all four counties of Western Mass. We often pursue um, long-term multi-year grants that are for counties because we feel like if the COG manages them, the COG will make sure Franklin County's needs are taken care of and are always concerned that otherwise they would not be. Um, our emergency preparedness program helped with uh, regional vaccination clinics, with working through COVID response, setting up a a coordination coalition during the onset of the pandemic, does a lot of public health preparedness planning, particularly busy in the last two years. Um, and as we talked about earlier, one of the major things we've been working on for about four years is to move our emergency communication system, our first responders to the states communication system. We currently own, the COG currently owns the existing emergency communication system and it's failing and its parts are no longer available. So this move to the state provides much more stability to our first responders. Homeland Security is another example of we pursued being the fiduciary for Homeland Security funds throughout the four counties of Western Mass um, to make sure that Franklin County's needs were being met. And we've been the fiduciary since 2004. And um, Homeland Security buys a lot of equipment, much of it year, used during COVID and during the vaccination clinics in particular. Our partnership for youth works on trying to improve health conditions of 
of youths, particularly middle school to high school. And we monitor that success by surveying all eighth, 10th and 12th graders and ask about their health options, uh, first use of drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, et cetera, and then use that information to figure out how our programming will be focused in the future. We also have a Mass in Motion grant through Partnership for Youth where we're really working on hunger issues, um, hunger and health issues, trying to increase SNAP benefits, trying to work with farms to get our local food to people who are hungry and working on diabetes prevention. And then finally, you will hear next month from our planning department, we provide a full suite as the regional planning agency for Franklin County, um, primarily grant funded, although we have some special technical assistance available through our planning director, Peggy Sloan. And then here is how you are represented by the COG. Trevor is our council rep and happens to be the council chair. Anna Lee, you're on the planning board. Carolyn Ness is on MAFCO, the, which is our public health emergency preparedness. Bill Swayze is on the regional emergency planning committee. And Trevor and Carolyn share the responsibilities of the community public health system oversight board. I tried to do that in 10 minutes. Do not know if I succeeded and I will stop sharing. How long did that take? Ooh, that feels like that was more than 10 minutes. I'm sorry. Hey. <laughs> oh, very quick. That was great. Can oh, you good. share that with us so that we have a, Yes, I mean, of course. That would be great. Thank you. Yep. Um, let's see. I guess um, for questions, maybe if you have questions, you can raise your hand either this way or via the question, the hand raised on the Zoom piece. Um, I, I will begin with one question if I can while people are figuring those things out, Linda, in terms of um, dues, wondering what Deerfield pays on an annual basis and also sort of what is covered automatically and when are there assessments above and beyond for special projects or special services, if you could give us uh, guidelines on that. I am very sorry that I did not bring the budget with me, so I do not oh, know sorry. what Deerfield pays, but I can get that for you. Um, the basic services covered we, is, is all of the special projects we work on, access to all of our grants and grant programs. We will often write grants specifically for towns to make sure that towns are getting the services they need all of the legislative advocacy that we do, which honestly, I feel like that's pretty much all I'm doing now. I'm been, I have been testifying at least three times a week on behalf of Franklin County and Franklin County needs. Um, and then access to all the workshops. And then, and then we have, um, we have, a, we have a certain amount of technical assistance, undefined, it kind of depends if towns call in and ask for something, then we will try, we always try to meet the needs of the towns. So would you be the person we would touch base with if we have a question as to whether or not FERCOG could help us with something or we try to see what the division is in FERCOG? Or? Yeah. It's always good to start with me and I never okay. pretend to be the expert. I will direct you to the correct staff person. Triage, we love triage. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, other, other um, questions from the planning board? Ah, Kathy, Kathy Wittroba. Hi, Linda, thank you for coming tonight. Um, that was great. That was really oh, oof, informative. And so one of my questions is, sifting through everything. Um, so you want to move our emergency communication system to the state system, which sounds like a great idea to me. Uh, my question is, is, so that's going to cover all of the region. Um, but how long does something like that take? Like, what is the, what is the point where it is not running at all? 
and you're trying to switch it from one system to another? Um, every project takes remarkably longer than you want it to. Right. Um, right. About, I would say about seven years ago, we began to realize that our emergency communication system was failing mm -hmm. and that parts were becoming more scarce. Mm -hmm. And so we started a countywide conversation on here's our options. I will say that when the Homeland Security funds bought the emergency communication system that is now dying mm -hmm. and a mistake that we made and a very serious mistake we made was mm -hmm. we assessed communities for the cost of maintaining that system. We did not assess communities enough to replace the system. Mm -hmm. And so when the system started failing, we had countywide conversations of here are our choices. Our choices are to move over to the state system, pros and cons to that, or to replace and continue to own a regional system, pros and cons to that. The biggest con would be we would need to assess towns the cost of a new emergency communication system plus the cost to replace it in 10 years because that's about the lifespan of, emerg of an emergency communication system. It took about two years of discussion to make the decision to move to the state system. It took about another year to get the state to agree that they should let us on their system and has taken about three years to work through that process. Once we worked through the process and received the grant, we received the grant in April or May of last year. And we have 95% of the equipment in and 55% of the departments fully transitioned over. Wow. So yeah. once we got through the politics of it all, everything went really quickly. Nice. My sense was Deerfield was very quick on it. <laughs> Deerfield, Chief Pachorik was was a leader right and he, and he um, not, <clears throat> Deerfield was great. Chief Pachorik helped advocate through the yep. whole thing. Plus Deerfield was the location where $3 million of equipment was delivered to your police station. And then we would bring our staff in and program it, divvy it up and move it out. Deerfield was instrumental in that. Right. And they're probably pretty well versed, I would imagine. Yes. In the system yeah. itself and the equipment and the disbursement of that information in, in a emergency situation. Okay. Thank you very much. That was great. great. Andrea? Yeah. Um, Anna Lee and I attended the short term rental workshop, which yep. was very instructive. And by the end, I don't know, I don't want to speak for Anna Lee, but my head was just. <laughs> and um, it made us realize that at some point we will have to address that. Would we be able to um, call FERC again to help us yeah. beyond the workshop actually go step by step the, um, a way that we could create a bylaw that would um, address that issue? The best thing to do is when the district local technical assistance project solicitation comes out, ask for that because. Um, because that's going to be a big project, and so that is the that is the easiest way for us to devote a significant amount of time and money to a project. So, How do we know when that list comes out? Um, you, I can what tell you. Request? Number one, it will it will go to Casey, and uh -huh. we will ask Casey to distribute it to all of the boards in town, and then ask Casey to to. Uh, work with all of the boards to prioritize, identify and prioritize your needs and issues. So for instance, one of the priorities last year was a visa, a second phase feasibility study of the South County Senior Center, which we are funding now, right now. So it will come out we know the grant was, the, the money was allocated in the state budget, so we know we will get the grant, but we do not send out that project solicitation list until after we know what the, what the state is requiring about how we spend the money. They sometimes tweak what they want us to focus on, 
So we usually wait till we know what the state wants and requires, and then we send out the forms. Okay, thank you. De December, January, generally. Oh, it's around the corner. Yeah, it's a calendar year grant. Um, I have another question. In general, are there sort of FERCOG activities, opportunities that maybe especially relate to planning, but that we could take advantage of that we're not taking advantage of now that you might say, hey guys, you might wanna consider this? Almost always. <laughs> um, I, but, I, but I'll have to get back to you with that one too, because I, I think you get a fair amount of service. It, I, I don't know if all of you are new to the planning board, but um, for many years, you bought planning services from the COG and Pat Smith was kind of your planner. And so De the Deerfield Planning Board knows how to access the services of the COG probably better than most planning boards. So I expect you're taking advantage of most that's available, but, but it's hard. we do so many things that sometimes not, sometimes you don't always know. So let me get that list of what you, Mm -hmm. what we are already doing and then I'll see if there's anything. Oh, else. thank you. That would be helpful. That's nice. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, yes, Kathy Sylvester. So um, I was talking to someone on the planning board in Ashfield and I believe um, someone from Burkhog came to speak to them about how climate change might impact their community. Do you do something like that? Yeah, we've done a couple of things. We have, we've done, um, we just finished the Franklin County Stormwater Management Plan. And we also just finished a climate resiliency plan for the Deerfield River watershed. So either one of those could be what um, they were talking about. We also did the culvert assessment for Ashfield. We just finished culvert assessments for Deerfield. So it could have been any one of those things. We do a lot of climate oh. resiliency work. Yeah. But you haven't spoke to our planning board recently, or I oh, mean, yeah. I just came yes. on, so I don't know. Yes, we, we worked with, actually, I think oh, it was Alyssa, Alyssa to um, look at our um, <clears throat> floodplain bylaws. By mm -hmm. So they, they were very helpful with the floodplain bylaw okay. structure. Do you guys, that do you all- Two years ago, three years ago. Just Do you all get our our quarterly yeah. updates? I think so. Well, we get we get the um, newsletter, which I then forward oh. to the planning board. Is that the same? No. No. We, we oh. before every council meeting, I do um, updates for all the council members of um, everything the cog has been doing for the past quarter. And it does summarize nearly all of the planning projects that we're working on. Annalee, I can make sure I get you onto that list if you could distribute it to the other members. But that would be a good way, Kathy, for you to see, like you might wanna hear about the pollinator plan, you might wanna hear about the stormwater management plan or the culvert assessment or whatever, and you can see the projects and we can get staff to come and talk to you about that. Okay, great, thank you. What that's is it? Great. That's a, a, a newsletter. That's not the newsletter. That's something else. No, the newsletter is we pick one article from every category. The council updates, you have to be patient because they're usually 12 to 15 pages long. It's it's pretty extensive. And it and it really is because our because our advisory board only meets quarterly, we try to give them as much information every quarter and so we create this summary of here's everything we've been doing in the last quarter that's actually a really good um ongoing education for us of what the COG does mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to read that list mm -hmm. that's helpful that's good okay other questions this is good Melinda also we were involved in the um MVP grant was that was through also through the COG and we've been that's an ongoing um, vulnerable places yeah. grant which was really helpful. <clears throat> Again, it's a great program. It's a great program that that they've recognized 
that you, you need to go from plan to implementation to evaluation and they provide funding all the way through. That's so rare. It was, it's a great program. That's good. I just have one quick question. Go so Kathy. The um, youth community that work that you do, so it said it's mostly middle school and high school. Is this a, a, a risk group that you consider as a risk group and what types of things do you provide? The whole, the whole theory of the Partnership for Youth is that you evaluate risk factors, what, what, what family or community or other dynamics would lead a, a youth, young person, usually 13 to 18, to make bad choices, mm -hmm. and then protective factors. What are those factors that would prevent someone, prevent the young person from making bad choices. And so the it could be something like, we are going to encourage family dinners, or we're going to encourage schools to work together to have safe ride homes, or those are the kind of protective factors that have, have been proven to work. And we generally work with all of the school districts in Franklin County. They're kind of our entree in. Yeah. We aren't working directly with the youth. We are providing the resources for the school districts to work with the youth. Uh, okay, that's good. Perfect, thank you. Nice. It's a cool model. Yes, important model, especially now. Yeah. Family dinners. <laughs> Wouldn't think that would, yeah, those days. <laughs> Other questions? <clears throat> you have any questions for us, Linda? Mm. Um, I just moved to Deerfield uh, oh, about a year ago. So you're welcome. my planning board. I'm so excited. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, we will see you at town meeting and hopefully yes. at more Zooms. <laughs> yes. I great. don't have questions except that if you have, um, I will get all of the answers and maybe send Peg and Alyssa with specific answers. But I'll also send you, Annalie, the council updates, get you on that list and get more information about the assessment to you. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. welcome. That's good. Thank you. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, Linda, thank you very much. Really appreciate having you this evening. Thank you so much. Nice okay. to meet you all. Yes, and welcome to Deerfield. Thank yeah. you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. That was great. That's good. Yeah, that's great. Sometimes you need to be told things again and again and again. Maybe I'll go back now and read, look at their um, <clears throat> website again and it will even filter in a little bit more. So just for, for everybody's <clears throat> edification. So we worked with Pat Smith, who she, she referred to, whom she referred to um, for a long time. I think when I first joined the board and then for six years, I, th I we were, adrift when she retired because we didn't pick somebody else up they didn't have anybody else for us at the cog at that time staffing wise they were a little slim and so that's that's when we started writing our own decisions she was great she helped us write decisions she did a lot of the things that um jen does now for us um so anyway and she was in very insightful about franklin county towns which I think it's very specific, you know, that we're um, a specific kind of town, uh, 16 towns. These are small, like Deerfield's a behemoth among <laughs> this group of towns. And uh, so I, I and she, but she was incredibly helpful and kept us connected with the cog too. At that nice. time. Yeah. So we kind of lost that a little bit um, with shifting away from uh, having Pat as a, uh, a, an advisor and a consultant. Well, as um, Linda mentioned at our December meeting, the um, two representatives, so two people from the planning department at the Fair Cog um, are going to come and talk with us, talking especially about some of the myriad of housing issues, but also um, planning um, services that Fair Cog could offer or assist us with. And in particular, as, as We've noted uh, the select board seems to be quite interested or has mentioned a number of times recently about um, the possibility of having a town planner, sharing a planner with other towns, whatnot. And so we might be able to talk with um, 
them a little bit more about that or find out what their thoughts are with that at the December meeting. So that would be a nice train to jump back on. <laughs> Seems good. All righty. So um, Mr. Rodriguez is here for the a and for 94 Sugar Loaf and also Bob Walden is here. And maybe Bob, if you want to introduce it, um, and then um, Mr. Rodriguez can chime in there if we have any questions specifically for him, that would be good. And I don't know, maybe if we're back with sharing screen, Alex, with the, um, especially with the map. So you know, Bob, where's Bob? Yeah. Bob Bolt, building inspector is somewhere. I see him somewhere. Oh, I'm right here. Oh, there you Hello. are. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, it's, well, it's a A&R plan to divide the lot into three lots. Um, it's a little different. There's a strip of land owned by the Gramacchis that blocks. Can we, excuse me for interrupting. Can we bring that up so we can see it? I don't know who brings it up, if it's Alex or if it's Bob. I don't have it. Um, uh, the ability yeah, to bring I, it up. Um, can you send it to Alex? Me? Can, um, is, is it? Is I it on the way? I have it. I don't know if I can share it. Yes, you certainly can. I if mean, you have it. I don't know if I have the technical ability. Oh, I okay. <laughs> I only have a piece of paper. I, I so. can do it. I can do it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, I was sharing before inadvertently, so I might as well share on purpose this time. But let's see. Here's the go. problem. Well, except for that, I want to turn it. Huh. Let me see if that's I can. Okay. You can see it. Yeah, that's good. Sorry. That's good. No, it was better this way. Okay. Sorry. That's fine. Thank you, Rachel. So Bob, excuse us for interrupting. Yeah, so they're, when they first came to me asking me, there's a strip of land, very tiny strip of land along Gramacchi that blocks the frontage to both those lots. And it leaves about 30 feet of frontage on the one on lot B. So the question brought to me was, you know, is that adequate for access? And it, and it didn't have adequate frontage by definition is how I saw it. So they came back with this triangular piece for the frontage requirement. This one? Yes. So that they'd have 117 feet of frontage to access lot B. I mean, that can't count towards the lot square footage, but I don't, I think it meets the definition of frontage. I mean, it's an un uninterrupted frontage along Gramacchi Avenue, 117 feet long. And there's adequate room to put a driveway in because they can come 10 feet off the pen on Gramacchi and 10 feet off the new pen on the Sugarloaf piece and have a 12 foot wide driveway. And our definition of frontage is continuous along a street line with adequate access for fire and safety. So I felt like it met the frontage definition. Um, so I don't, I don't speak out of turn. My name is uh, Daniel Sauls. I'm a land surveyor that that did the survey. And I okay, thought that'd be great. Yes, be really good to come to this meeting because it is really unusual. <laughs> um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have about it. Um, Deerfield's uh, planning board regulations are or, and zoning bylaws are a little bit different in that they allow. Uh, a property to have frontage that doesn't meet the the minimum lot depth for you know required by the zoning for that district um but as long as it's adequate frontage it could be considered frontage but it can't be used to calculate the minimum area uh, correct yeah. th this was a really a, a weird one the uh that little triangular sliver that blocks off Gramacchi Ave from the rest of Mr. Rodriguez's property is, is what's now referred to as a spite sliver. Um, when they subdivided 
the, the, the property they own and laid out Gramacki Ave in Deerfield. Uh, there was a disagreement between the Gramackis and the Wysockis that made them withhold that, that little sliver. Um, it's completely illegal now <laughs> with every zoning bylaw, but th there was a way to at least get the one building lot out of, out of the property based on the note seven exception in Deerfield zoning that uh, if you exempt the area, you could use the frontage as long as there weren't any angles of less than or more than 60 degrees off of the frontage to create the property. Um, I think the really unusual part of this, too, is that Miss Gramacki at this point wants to buy what would be um, parcel A, I called it. Uh, there will still be a little, she, she owns the sliver from the proposed parcel A all the way to the unmonumented point on Gramacki Ave in front of parcel B. Um, parcel A would be- I, I, so I'm, Can I just ask yeah. for clarification what you're talking about? Because I really don't see what you're talking about. So she owns this property. Not, no. she will. Okay. No, no. Alex Rodriguez currently owns all, all of this. Of this. Property. Right, yep. right, right. So what does she own? She owns, it's a triangular sliver that's really hard to see on the plan. And I revised this thing a million times. I was trying to blow it up and make it clear, but essentially they reserved a, a slice that is one foot wide on the Western side of Alex's property. Uh, going- This goes North South. Um, 200.59 feet to the east to, to nothing along uh, here yeah is it correct is it yeah. that little rectangle it's a little tiny it, sliver it's a little tiny triangle this? Oh. yeah it, it, it's what's now called a spite sliver um, so this was the spite sliver this that right is here the spite sliver Ooh. <sighs> and i, I would have put a note on the plan and i i, I told alex that my, I, I would have put a note on parcel A would have been not a building lot under current zoning because it's blocked by what Gramacki owns. And I would have suggested that, you know, you put an easement on the back line so that he could maintain the property. But there's an agreement in place with Gramacki and Alex that she's going to purchase the property and combine it with the spite sliver to, to make the building lot for that part of it. Um, the, the really unfortunate part of this is that she still did not want to relinquish the part of the, the triangle that will be on Gromacki Ave in front of Parcel B. Can I just ask you, sir, it is the, so she only owns that. She doesn't own this. She, it, it's all that is left of the Gromacki's holdings from it was originally a 6.225 acre lot when they subdivided and laid out Gramacki Ave. Uh, it, it was really a, a personal dispute between the Gramackis and it was Anthony Wysocki owned what Alex owns now. So so we need to make sure that this I, I mean in, in doing any of this this is still not a buildable lot. Lot A is still hmm. not a buildable lot. Well, so it doesn't have a note on that it is not a buildable lot because it is to be conveyed to and combined with other lands of Gramacki, which is the spite sliver, which gives her adequate frontage and adequate area to be a buildable lot if that transaction happens. Uh, then what happens, what, what happens to parcel B? Parcel B has the adequate frontage on Gramacki Ave. Uh, the, I think the requirement is 100 feet Gramac, uh, parcel B has 117.38 feet of frontage, which meets the zoning requirement. The stipulation in Deerfield zoning is that uh, there's also a minimum lot depth of 50 feet for a lot in this area. The stipulation in Deerfield zoning is, it's a uh, footnote seven, any area of a proposed lot that does not meet the required minimum depth cannot be used to calculate the minimum lot area in the district. So in this case, I mean, there's plenty of area exempting that. Uh, it, it, you know, this is- This cannot be counted. 
Yeah, again, that, that, that part of the area right. can't be counted. And then, you know, I would never do this plan if the building inspector, I mean, there's plenty of room to put a, a driveway in there to meet the setbacks for a driveway and ensure adequate access for uh, yeah, fire I, trucks I, and police too. Um, okay, so can I ask again, so this, this sliver, whatever you call that, spike, mm -hmm. whatever, that is only uh, that it's only on parcel A. It does not also. I mean, there's a little square that goes over parcel A and parcel B, and no, so it, 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 it goes block, down parcel B. Also. It blocks one hundred point five nine feet of um, parcel B as well. So that otherwise parcel B would have uh, two hundred and seventeen point four feet of frontage on it. Mm -hmm. So she is still going to own. And and like I said, I I, I think it's really unfortunate she didn't want to just relinquish that. To, uh clean this up i i i really do uh can we can we uh be more encouraging of that so that you know how if we end know, up with look i'm the land surveyor and and gotcha. i can suggest all the sensibility <laughs> in the world but this is a, a family feud that goes back for all time <laughs> um and, and i really I, I really thought that that being able to create a building lot on the, the law anyways would encourage her to that was sort of the leverage right like you can't do anything with this because of the spike sliver there is a way under the deerfield zoning to to, to do this uh i really thought that that would maybe encourage a little bit of i i, I as a surveyor i i really don't like looking at a piece of property shape like this i i don't well and, and, and we we want to encourage um housing uh you know to be available and if we have a beautiful lot in a nice area of town that can't be built on that's kind of a problem well i and i think you know with the parcel a to be conveyed and combined with other land of Grimaki, she will have adequate frontage for that to be a building lot and i think her intent is to uh build a you know house for one of her grandkids or something um so I'm, this is Emily. I have a question. Is our our main focus really is parcel B? Um, we're not really concerned with parcel A and whether or not that can convey. You know, the agreement falls through or doesn't. Yeah, no. Right? It, is that correct? Yeah. Well, you are. And and you oh. know, I put the note on that uh, to be conveyed to and combined with other land of Vermacki. If that transaction failed to happen, then you know, the building inspector would not issue a building permit for the lot uh, because it wouldn't have adequate adequate frontage. Um, I only created this plan because that agreement is in place. Otherwise, like I said, my note would have said um, not a building lot. And I would have suggested to Alex that he put an easement through parcel B to access parcel A because it would be cutting it off to, to maintain it as needed. Um, but the uh, the agreement is in place, and uh, I, I like I said, I, I just think it's unfortunate she doesn't want to just give up that little part that's gonna be blocking uh, parcel B from the, the the frontage. It's 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 crazy. Um, I know with our site plan review proposals, we can approve something with conditions, and I'm a little uncertain about that for A and R's, but potentially is that a condition that we would endorse this a and r contingent upon the um successful you, conveyance you can, of parcel a you can and you should um you can you can put um conditions on an a and r uh, so you should okay. definitely yeah what about the it looks like and rachel you've done a great job with blowing this up it looks like there's a barn from that that property that's already that's on parcel B. What what happened? Do we so, care about that? They're well, going to remove the barn. It's, yeah. yeah, it's it's going to be removed. Um, okay. So you can also put a condition on that, you know, endorsement contingent upon removal. It's up to you if you want to put a a time on that. You might want to ask Alex about his availability of a contractor to, to do the work. Um, it's hard to plan on that right now, but uh, but. Again, the, the building inspector has a lot of latitude to um, 
limit permitting based on those conditions not being met. So I'm afraid I'm still confused. So there are now, all of this land is owned by Mr. Rodriguez and part of it is going to be conveyed to Ms. Gromacki. Am I understanding that correctly? So, yeah, and, and this is the this is why I'm here. Um, right. so, so it says the number four um, of the ANR application, it says the number of existing parcels and lots is one. The number of new parcels lots is blank. So what is that blank number gonna be? I'm not sure, I didn't fill that out. And actually I um, left that to the, the town clerk because towns have different interpretations of existing lots and new lots. Uh, mm -hmm. Some towns consider uh, the remaining land a new lot as well. Yes. Uh, so some towns it's would say three new lots. In other words, yeah, some towns would say three yeah, new lots. Some but... towns would say two new lots. Um, if that's blank, you know, when I sent Alex in to the town clerk, I I, I suggest he get his guidance there from. Uh, the I did. I did ask Karen. She said that typically the sugar loaf lot would remain the same and. So I don't know whether that really, I don't know the way to, and, and to that's why come I, up with, is that three or two lots being created? Well, and, and to be honest, that's why I don't, uh, you know, I'll start the A&R form for people, the form A, but um, I always say, just ask the town clerk. And, you know, the fee is dependent on the interpretation of new lots versus, uh, so I leave that blank. If it didn't get filled in, I'm not sure why. Well, then it sounds like if, if that's blank, which is also determinant of the fee, then perhaps the um, application can't be acted upon until that's completed? Well, you know, that's not really for me to interpret or not. Um, I suspect that Alex wrote a check for whatever the fee was, and you could sort of interpret what the town clerk's in idea of new versus uh, new from existing uh, yeah. whatever she charged him is, is sort of defined. looks like it was one hundred sixty dollars. <laughs> yeah, I think it's creating. It was charged as if it's creating two new lots, and the existing lot stays the same. So again, that makes that, sense. Yeah, and if the four A is blank in that part, I, I think the check sort of speaks to what that should say. So. If an existing lot is altered, would the town of Deerfield consider that then become a new lot? So altered even by removing that barn? Would, would that, is, you know what I mean? So there's one existing lot, two new lots. Would altering an existing lot generate the classification of a new lot? Well, the removal of the barn doesn't alter the existing lot in, in a, a, a a property sense or a, a yeah. planning board purview mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the biggest thing would be, like I said, you could put a condition on that, you know, this is contingent upon removal of the barn. Um, it, it, there's no change in the conformity of the lot, the existing lot in, in any way. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, there's also an existing carriage house mm -hmm. and that carriage house wouldn't meet the setback to the property line on here. And I'll, sometimes I'll put that on there and note like it's an existing non-conforming setback. You know, it's not altering the, the, the property in that way. Um, the, the, the barn, like I said, you, you certainly could put a contingency on that this is, the, the barn has to go for this to be a building lot. You know, you can't make a, Something I more not. I wouldn't allow give a building permit without the barn gone. Exactly right. Yeah. So, I would say to follow up on Kathy's question, it sound it seems like where it says remaining land of Alex Rodriguez, that um, that little trapezoid actually does change the site, the configuration of that lot, right? Well, no, the remaining trapezoid is owned by Gramacki, um, and it's already an existing non-conforming lot. So she oh. owns, and, and this is something new for the assessor. So I noted on the plan that it's now or formerly Gene Gramacki tax map 183 20.1. Now, if you look at the assessor's maps, 
they don't have that as its own separate parcel that is one foot wide tapering down to nothing at the end. This recently came to their attention and I put the 183 20.1, their intent is to use that designation uh, for assessment purposes going forward. They're gonna amend the maps and create the triangle on the, the newer maps. Um, but no, the, the, that is an existing nonconformity. Uh, and, and one of the big reasons I was here, I had all sorts of notes all over this plan and you're allowed to use a portion of a road as frontage for a property and then make a weird shape to make the rest of the property to make it buildable. But one of the big conditions in, in Deerfield's exceptions is the angle of the new property off of the road and it has to be less than 60 degrees. And you know, that angle is is nothing at the, the peak of the triangle, but it's an existing nonconformity, not something that's being altered by the ANR that we're, we're doing here. Um, and, and again, I, I'm just gonna reiterate, I, I think it's crazy that she wouldn't just, you know, grant that over the, the proposed parcel B, I, I, I do. Um, Hmm. But she will, she will own a, a, that little tiny section. I mean, her property is going to, that, that parcel A is going to run along Grimacki Avenue, <laughs> the, the, the whole distance in front of parcel B, and then angle back uh, to the new line of between parcel A and parcel B. It, it's it's going to be a really strange shaped piece of property. Um, again, the, the, it's an existing non-conforming feature. It's, it's not making a non-conforming property more non-conforming. It just is what it is. She, she owns that frontage. <laughs> hmm. And, and just to be clear, that kind of action has been outlawed, you know, for quite some time now. You, you, you can't Should. do something like that now. Yeah. Hmm. So. I, I don't, I'm still confused. So is, is parcel B a building lot or not? Yes, well, so parcel B be a building lot when you consider from, if you see that little triangle symbol yeah. at the end yeah. of the little spike strip there, we'll give it frontage from that triangle to Sugarloaf Street of 117 feet. But I thought that, she owned that triangle. No, no, she doesn't own that part. That that was owned by Mr. Rodriguez. He's going to give that the parcel B to create a building lot. So he's She's, changing his building lot. Or he's his changing lot. his building lot to allow access to parcel B. I thought that's what we were talking about all this No, time. there's another little tiny, tiny sliver that blocks in front of the two lots. It's and confusing because we're talking about two triangles. And I wish I could point to it, but... Yeah, Rachel's so, doing a pretty good job here. So I do, actually, I do apologize. That's not clearer, but that that is, you know, at the scale that I had to do the plan, it's it's almost impossible yeah. to illustrate that. Um, so the frontage is is Bob. Just some, the frontage is from here to here. That's the correct. building lot. Correct. So that is what makes this building lot frontage, and it's it's the opposite of any kind of flag thing because the frontage well, there would be anyway. Th these are the angles that are the awkward angles like we have to watch out for those angles right they'll have to stay she'll have to stay 10 feet in from that new point and 10 feet in from mr rodriguez's new point and to according to the driveway by law but that still leaves her 12 feet for a driveway which is an adequate access for, right yeah and, and the angles coming off of the intersecting roadways are or less than feet. Yeah. you know what, so, what what is allowable so and, and, so and, and, the, and the frontage is on Sugarloaf. It's not on Gromacki. No, no, it's on Gromacki. It's on Gromacki, right? It's here. on Gromacki. Yeah. Okay. So, Kathy, this is the, this is the spite spike. Yeah. It's here. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's tiny. Oh, I see that. Wildly tiny, and it goes all the way, apparently. Wow. How did yep. that happen? Keeps going right to there, to that right, point right there. Right there. Yeah. Okay, so so we're changing lot, the Rodriguez lot, 
And then no, they're, it, yeah, we're changing the whole Rodriguez lot. Right. And then we're creating two new lots, which is proposed under number five on this A and R. It right. does clarify that they're looking at two new lots. So this is his whole lot right here. But you're really changing the Rodriguez lot. So there's three lots. Yeah, but Mr. Rodriguez's lot will still be a conforming building lot. They're uh -huh. just not creating a non-conforming lot. This frontage is along Sugarloaf. Yes, Sugar yeah. Loaf. No, I understand. But we're making his parcel smaller, really. Right. Yeah. But he still has adequate um frontage and cover all. in and lot size and everything. It's not yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not creating an illegal lot or anything. Right, right. No, I'm just trying to make sure that this paperwork, which didn't say the number of new parcels, mm -hmm. but under number five, it says two new lots. So to cover it, we're not okay. counting his property as a new right, lot. That, that right. remains the lot, the the yeah. number it is, right? The lot map and lot number. Okay. And, and what is, I'm sorry. No. What is our concern about the carriage house? Would because it's not set back. That's a from. separate issue. That's a non-conforming structure. That doesn't make it a non-conforming lot. Like so, that's a pre-existing non-conforming structure because it's too close to the property line. But that's just the way it is. I mean, and it's very old. Well, yeah, it's an, yeah, and it's a, you, an existing non-conformity, like to an existing prop, like that. That property line is not being altered in you know for this A and R. So right. it's acceptable that it doesn't meet the minimum setback currently because it was it's a pre-existing property. property. Yeah. It's that distance right there. That's too yeah. So it sounds like other than the um sort of wisdom or not of having that teeny teeny tiny little sliver, which it sounds like we don't really have much control over our main considerations like still with this A&R would be that there would be a, um, a condition that it could it could be endorsed uh, pending pending or contingent upon barn removal and conveyance of parcel A to and conveyance of par parcel A to a new owner really is that correct I mean do, do we have to we, be if I could clarify that I if I could clarify that, parcel A wouldn't be a buildable lot unless it was conveyed to the Gramackis. Oh. Or, the, or, or they sold that strip to whoever, you know what I mean? That, so we, that's why I think we we just want to put an asterisk on there. Two things. These are these are going to be for sale, right? So the, as Bob said, the- Oh, the, no, they're, they're actually both already sold, <laughs> interestingly. Um, the owner, Alex, didn't even, you know, he just owned his house and lived in his house and people approached him kind of out of the blue. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's an agreement in place for, for both of them. So the purchase and sale is in place, but but so what you're saying, but we still, <laughs> in advance of that, we we can't make it, a, we can, it's not well, so, a lot until so, so, that happens and they're going to have to come before us. And planning boards can't really, like you guys are evaluating the, the proposal in relation to the current zoning, right? And ultimately, your ability to see if that's adequate, viable access is is pretty limited on a piece of paper, anyway. So, really, it's the the building inspector is is kind of the the stopgap there, where you guys could look at this and say, well, it meets the frontage and the zoning. When he evaluates permitting a building on that property, if he looks at it and says, well. Yeah, it's got a hundred feet of frontage, but it's a thirty foot cliff. Um, just because you got, and that's why I put the note on there. You know, uh, planning board endorsement does not uh, certify that this is a buildable lot, right? So, without the the conveyance happening, I mean, his job as the building inspector is to not permit it. Um, yeah, I wouldn't allow building it, or per, I wouldn't allow lot A to build on without access through the frontage. Okay. And, and oh, sorry. No, no, total non sequitur. Daniel, can you give us your, your full name so we can have that for the minutes? Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Daniel Sauls. Sauls, S A L S? S A L L S. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, Bob. Well, I was just saying that he, he was correct. I mean, I, I wouldn't allow 
parcel A to be built upon without the frontage being owned by parcel A, whoever that is, like whether Gramacki sell both pieces to somebody else, then that would be fine. Or if it all fell apart, then parcel A would be a landlocked piece until the Gramacki was willing to sell that strip for frontage. And, and as the surveyor doing this plan, I my my comfort zone was more to just identify it as not a building lot. Um, and and I my preference was to put an easement through parcel B so that if that sale fell through, Alex could maintain the landlocked piece. I mean, it's funny, it's landlocked, right? It's one foot wide at one end and uh, you could literally lift a lawnmower over the other end to, to mow it and maintain it. But, uh, but, but I was fairly satisfied that, you know, that is actually happening. And um, if it doesn't, you know, ultimately the building inspector wouldn't permit it, but my, my preference was to have a, a maintenance easement until it, it went through, but. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> endorsements contingent upon one, the building removal and two, and this is where I'm a little bit unsure about what the actual verbiage would be that number two would be notation that building lot A is not a, build, a buildable lot in its current configuration. Is that correct? Would that be accurate? I, I would say, and if you know, you have town council that consults on this, you might want to just, you know, run, run it by them just to. I think that's fairly, it's really standard, just a notation saying that it's not a buildable lot as it stands. That's not to say that it couldn't be a buildable lot that, but when we are approved, when we are not approving it, because it's do not approve, but when we are endorsing it, sorry, um, this is part of part of the eyes on that we get to have. That's not unusual. Um, okay. Would we indicate why it is not buildable in case somebody would? No. A guy something. like Bob is going to see it right away. It's not like, but we don't always have Bob. Next guy is going to come along. It's just a matter of. I mean, that was that was a very tricky one. That little strip there. Super yeah, super weird, and it's uh, that's but again I, not not even legal anymore. It's it's just which is part of the reason that I would feel more comfortable having this um, addendum, just because it's not the kind of thing that is easily cited because it's unusual. Denise, did you have a question? Thank you. Oh, I was just going to say so. Basically, it's only a building lot if Gramacki if Gramacki buys that because they currently own that spite strip. So unless Gramacki, unless Gramacki buys it, it is not a building lot. Period. Or sells the strips. Exactly. Yeah. Or sells it. Right. Sells it. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Yeah. Rodriguez, I don't know if there's anything you want to add or if there are other questions that we should have from the planning board. No, um, Daniel pretty, pretty did a pretty good job advocating for, uh, for the plan. So I know it's unusual. So I commend, him, I commend him for his efforts. Thank oh, you. Just to be clear though, surveyors are not advocates. We are impartial reporters. Of well, well, just in the conversation <laughs> of the night, not in, not in general, just for hire. We got that, we get it. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Thanks. W would we also ask that the, um, that the a &R application be amended to include a number in, uh, Number four and number four number of new parcels slash lots is two, right? But it's but I wrote the two in. <laughs> I mean, so. oh no, but it sounds like seems like it is. It is, and that's what they've said in the well, that's further part of the, the town clerk charged. And and like I said, some towns they towns just look at it differently. You know, you're taking a building lot out of one parcel. Some towns say, well, you're creating two new parcels. Some towns say you're creating one new parcel. Yeah. yeah. My, point, my point is that some number be put in that on that line, yeah. not by us. I was, I was just going to say a great example would be like the Sugarloaf condominiums where you took a lot and then divided it into all kinds of lots that created all new lots mm -hmm. where this would leave Mr. Rodriguez's lot the same number. So two, just two different ways to visualize it.
And, and you know, I, I I don't know how it got missed. It, that number didn't get filled in when the town clerk took the paperwork, but, you know, she sort of identified that when she took the check for what she thought was new lots and what was, so. So do you feel, Bob, I mean, in particular, do you feel that that's adequate given the rest of the application? Well, yeah, you you could ask that you want the number. That's up to you. But I do I do feel like it's creating two new lots. And leaving one the That's same. What it seems. But I'm not the town clerk, so but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But one it says a number five. Yeah. You look two new lots. So it's just they didn't put the number in number four. Maybe that's clear by implication, especially with the fee as well as later on in the reply. Yeah. My my point is that for completeness, we don't want it to be blank and have somebody put in, I don't know, some crazy number later. <laughs> right. So Andrea, then would you like to make the motion? <laughs> and I think we now maybe have three that that it would be to endorse the ANR with the conditions that the number of buildable lots in um, item four to or item four be completed by the town clerk. Is that correct? I, I so move. Oh, well, well, we got a couple more. That a uh, contingent uh, number number two part is that the barn is removed. And number three, that there is a notation that lot A is not a buildable lot. As it currently stands? As, it, as currently configured. Mm -hmm. So moved. <laughs> I'm not repeating that. <laughs> second. <laughs> you got you got that, Rachel? <laughs> I second it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, me. Kathy. Sylvester second. Um, is there any further discussion? No. Okay. Um, I'll do a roll call. But somehow I just this was rando. <laughs> Denise Mason? Denise Mason, yes. Andrea Leapson. Andrea Leapson, yes. Kathy Sylvester. You're muted. Oops, Kathy is still muted. Sorry, Kathy Sylvester, yes. Kathy Wittroba? Kathy Wittroba, yes. Rachel Blaine? Rachel Blaine, yes. And Annalie Wolfcore, yes. So it is unanimously approved. And uh, I guess congratulations, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Thank Daniel. you. <laughs> At this point, we're, <laughs> we're good right, friends. I'm going to turn my video on for one second because I meant to do that at the beginning and just say thank you for listening to me. It was, uh, <laughs> you know, this was unusual. You know, I guess it was, I hope it was a little bit of fun for you guys too. Uh, thank you. For when me, I, it was, you know, a little different, but yeah. Great right, fun. Well, <laughs> yeah. Have a good night and uh, yeah, keep those spite slivers illegal. It's not You're much. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Now we all learned something new. Oh my gosh. These spikes. I mean, is public comment allowed? Uh, well, we will be having public comment at the end of our meeting. Okay, it was uh, just about parcel B. Uh, uh, well, um, we've already approved the ANR, but um, sure, Mr. Cunningham, go for it. Well, okay, I'm the purchaser of parcel B, I hope, in the future. And I was listening intently, and I think Daniel did a great job, and the building inspector and so on. I was hoping you would make some comment or recorded uh, opinion about the spite sliver along parcel B. You know, I can move ahead and, and live with the way it is and I'm happy to do that. I just thought maybe you would wanna go on the record somehow about that spite sliver and the blocking of the frontage. But, so thank you. Mm, okay, I well, I think, we all feel good that those are no longer allowed. <laughs> and it seems like our hands are somewhat tied. Denise? That's that's out of our purview to do anything about yeah. the site sliver. Unfortunately. What we can do is we can add it to the minutes. That is something that we would be on the watch for in the future, that it's a dilatory to positive growth So in the future. Yeah. That sounds reasonable, Rachel. That's good. All right, thank you. All right, 
Um, moving on then. Can anyone hear my background, two-year-old? We've got babies. That's so unfair. <laughs> You're just showing off, Annalie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I might show off just enough to mute in a moment. Um, so, um, moving on then for the another the other really major piece of our meeting this evening is wanting to have a review um, discussion amongst town amongst planning board members about um, town meeting and primarily bye, or really bye, 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 Bob. Bob. Bob's leaving. Have a bye, good night. Bye, Bob. <laughs> Thanks, right, good night, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your help. Um, if that's, I'll, I'll talk quickly and then I'll mute. Um, wanting to focus especially or really only on the planning board's um, role in all of the different things that happen with the town meeting, not really wanting to um, do a big <laughs> review of town meeting or so other. The special, other. the special town meeting that we just had yes. or? Yes, yes, the special town meeting that we just had. Um, I think in particular, as, um, as, uh, as kind of was reflecting on it as we were going through, and I think I gave you all a heads up to kind of make some notes of it. Um, there are, there are, um, were some new things that the planning board did in relation to the public hearings, and then also just um, some general sort of activity that um, for now for me as planning board chair that I've observed two out of two town meetings in terms of a big scurry of activity and just thinking about how we might be able to, um, how or if we might be able to control that a little bit better. Um, so, I mean, maybe I'll start out with potentially part of what might be an easier part is as we were having public hearings, um, we put forward some guidelines for public comments. And so interested in the planning board's um, thoughts about those. Um, our, and, and uh -oh. Oh, you're muted. Can't hear you. I press something by <laughs> um, public comments. Um, when we had public comments for the bylaws that were being presented, these were guidelines that we created that they would that each member of the public could speak once. Two minutes maximum. We had a timer. There was no back and forth between the person who was speaking and the planning board. Um, the presenter or the, the originator of the bylaw presented and closed, and at times also spoke as a resident. And then there was a question of having point of order. So, I mean, all of those things with public comments. So, and, and you know, maybe we can still try to have a little bit of uh, order to how we do this rather than just everybody interrupting everyone. So I'll just try to um, call on you as I see you raising your hand. So. The two minutes. Do you think the two minutes worked? Yeah, Kathy. Or go on, Kathy. Um, yeah, two minutes worked. I um, I found it frustrating that you know I couldn't ask a question of someone when I didn't understand what they were trying to say, so I could get some clarification. Um, or you know, especially when it came around on one instance, I'm I can't remember the particulars about trying to make a decision on something. Mm -hmm. Now, Kathy, is this in relation to the time when we were having public comment or is it in relation to when um, proposals were being brought forward to us? Because that actually is, is, is another area that I am interested in is when all of a sudden there's sort of a, a you know, last minute, which might be four to six weeks <laughs> prior to town meeting that, that a new bylaw is being presented to us and in some instances, like with the tourism overlay district, that was a pretty complex bylaw. And how, how can we in fact have good, like you say, Q&A, good, good review to be able to give the kind of, um, to sit, make the kind of decisions that we need to make? I think actually two different things happened. One was public comment when some, 
I think it was Skip Olmsted said something about his opinion about something, and I wasn't sure if he was for or against the project, and I couldn't get clarification. Ah. The other time oh, was, I think, on the tourism overlay district when I, I had a question, you know, I'm, I'm having to make a decision, and I couldn't ask a question yes. on the proposal. So I was, it was. Yeah, so Denise, just a second on that one. So, I mean, Rachel, because I think the addressing the first thing that you're saying, Kathy, in terms of what, asking for clarification, because I know at one point you were asking a clarification, Rachel, with Bruce St. Peter's for, uh, you know, in, in during, well, no, it was okay. I mean, during the public comment period. So is that, is that something we want to try to modify in the future? Or is that something that we kind of just have to live with? Or you asking me or asking me? No, no, just, you know, for some I put her people's thoughts. Denise? I, I thought that the issue was, Kathy, that when you asked one question, I don't recall what or what you wanted to ask, we had already voted. So if you wanted to ask that question, you should have asked it before we had voted. If I remember correctly, that may not be the case. I'm sorry. I wish I had better memory of it. I think. But I do remember <laughs> Rachel did ask. I, I that remember before. mine too. I uh, just excavate that, that it was about the canopies. <clears throat> And Bruce was, you know, eager to say no to canopy. And actually, looking at our bylaw, I would maybe amend it to put more, more specificity around canopy because our bylaw is kind of general. Like it, it could cover pavement. <laughs> but but this kind and of that was yeah. my question at the time, and I just didn't know, you know, where his concern was. And you're right, Kat, and I just busted out and asked. So, well, but that's yeah, and that's you know the facts of whether or not if we're if we want to have clarification from a member of the public, yeah, who is stating something, or even if they are stating something that maybe is incorrect, and we may right. want to, um, oh, clarify. You know, so what Judith Rathbone said, well, you've just brought out the solar thing out of the blue, and she made a big statement about that, and it, I just I, I was sitting in front of her at the annual town meeting. So she must have been like snoozing during that portion of it. Plus we've been working on it for years. Anyway, I was biting my tongue till it bled to try to say, no, in fact, this isn't just out of our back pocket. We've been really working on it. So, so I guess the broad question with this is when there is public comment, right now we're saying there will be no back and forth. Um, is, do we want to continue with that or would we like to consider moderate? So, yes, uh, that, so, so the example that Rachel just gave is one of correcting, uh, you know, right. the, pu the public record. So instead of, you know, it's not that we're disagreeing. No, we didn't just pull it out of our hats, but no, this, the discussions have been going on since, you know, t for the last two years, they may have been going on only, um, you know, among, uh, at the planning board, which is open to the public. So you could, you could have come. Um, this is not something that's uh, that's being decided quickly. Likewise, someone raised the question, well, why do we have to do the park now? And, you know, why is this just so suddenly coming up? No, it's not just suddenly coming up. So, right. so could, could we correct, could we offer corrections or maybe that doesn't even... Well, that's where, I mean, what I was kind of thinking it was hap seemed like what was happening is as people were saying, public was giving comments then we could jot down those comments and when we close the public meeting we can make those corrections so it doesn't sort of open up this free for all mm -hmm. or, or you know yeah. yes so for example um at one of the i think public hearings um somebody said oh there's a rumor that uh the town was going to go bankrupt if we didn't get treehouse in there and the finance committee i thought that was very interesting multiple members of the finance committee jumped up to say no 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 i don't know where you're getting this we are correcting this we're stopping this false information now and in these days misinformation is something we really need to address um so maybe misinformation is something we can address but i, I do like your idea of addressing it all at once but i think we also need to be careful not to let it slide because yeah. people say a lot of false things as we all know. And if you say them over and over again, people start to believe them, even though they're false. Mm -hmm. So maybe we do need to, um, to address some things immediately. Kathy, Kathy, Wachova? 
So it also, you know, and I don't have like long term on the board to give perspective on this, but it seems like we had a lot, heavy volume of information in a relatively short amount of time. And it was just a lot of different things. And we're all trying to like learn it, orient ourselves, understand our positions, listen to the community at large, not only in meetings, but just like walking the dog and getting gas, you know, and, and every, it was just, it was a lot of information that we had to, you know, filter and, you know, work through in a short amount of time. So, I mean, I think it's fair, even in a meeting situation like that, to ask somebody to clarify their position. For the record, could you please clarify your position so I understand your perspective, right? Rather than, I, I think it's a great idea to allow people to have their two minutes to speak. If we start getting in this back and forth dialogue, well, we, we could be there all night long, right? So you get your two minutes. Then if we understand clearly what they're saying, then great, you know, next person, please speak. But if we are, if any one of us is unclear to say, could you please clarify that for the record? Would this tie into, um, I know in some meetings they're starting to be, we start use point of order. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really that familiar with that from a Robert's rules standpoint, but would this be something that could sort of put more formality mm -hmm. around it rather than, mm -hmm the free for all back and forth of, you know, point, well, whether or not it's point of order, but doing something to say a clarification point or something like that. But what does, what does point of order really mean? Well, I'm right. not, I don't know either. Google it. <laughs> question yeah, raised I'm by, yeah, that right now. It's a oh, question. Oh, good. Denise knows. What is question it? raised by member regarding some point considered to be irregular in the conduct of the meeting. Oh, it's, so it doesn't. it's a question. It's, Someone in, in the audience raises a question because they feel that something um, something is considered irregular in mm. the, in the meeting. Okay, the conduct of the meeting. So it wouldn't so would be include, misinformation. Would, it wouldn't be misinformation, or would it be Denise? I don't know whether that would be misinformation. Oh. I know that Bob Decker was the one who was saying point of order, point of order. <laughs> so, so was Jan Remillard. Well, this definition right, says that's someone. Great. Someone draws attention to a rules violation in yes. a meeting of yep. a deliberate assembly. So somebody, a point of order is saying that is in violation of X. Mm -hmm. So, so falsehood would not be in violation. I mean, I, I'm just wondering too, if like we can, not to jump in front of anybody, but if we can, I just felt like it was, just an overwhelming amount of various types of information converging in this almost frenzy of, but we have to, because we need to right. we get this in and we have to get it in the paper. And we're kind of like, how, how do we learn, make a position if that is what we need to do or not? Right. Um, well, I, I think, think that's I'll, a great I'll, question, I Kathy. I did a and very I think... good job. <laughs> I just think it came at like a onslaught of stress. Let's, let's put that in the parking lot for a minute and just tie yeah. up this one piece about um, do we feel that right now having just the public to present for two minutes, um, if there is misinformation or if there is uh, people are asking us questions that we do that at the end of the public hearing time, just yeah. like we did this time, or do we want to modify that in? Denise? I think we should do it at the end because I think that that puts us back in the position that we should be in, that we are take that we are in control of the meeting because if not, it's going to go off the rails and then we do it for one person, the next person's going to do it. It's going to be very chaotic. And I think I think it's a lot more proactive doing it that way. And I think each of us should be responsible in writing, jotting down anything that's wrong. And then at the end, you yep. ask us. Did it, is, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Right. Find any irregularities or okay. something. All right. Yeah, Rachel? I think I, I agree with, and I just would add that I think it, one, pushes us to listen more carefully, yes. and two, it is just more civil. Um, yes. I, I felt that it was a little easier to just listen. I felt the frustration of the, the townspeople who were there to make their comment. I think it's easier when they're on Zoom to make their comment, done, boom. But but when they're standing there and they've waited and they want to make their comment. So I, I do think we want to maybe, you know, we might extend it 
to three minutes. Like we might, we might want to be able to say, look, we're, we're listening here um, and we're hoping that, but that they're going to hear each other. Um, and so moderating that with some flexibility so that, but, but I liked the saving our comments until the end. So we're just listening. Two, maybe we can even say two to three minutes. I mean, I found sitting next to Denise with her iPhone there mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that pretty soon people, people got it. Yeah. That, and, mm -hmm. and they were working hard to stay within in a concise way. And it mm -hmm. seemed to work well. But maybe if we said a two to three minute piece and then we really cut it off or what? I Good. worry about the ambiguity of that. Okay. Um, I okay. personally minute. Sorry, I personally think two minutes was was adequate. Yeah, and I think some, which I, I was actually shocked, did quite a bit less than two minutes. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I think it's good. I think if we continued on and found out that it wasn't, then we could change it. But there's a big difference between two and three minutes. There is. Okay. And then people yeah. are just thrown on. So it, it makes people be more concise and focused. Okay. Okay. I think the other thing that we ran into several times was they're going over their time. They're going over the time. Like it was almost second grade. Like they're going over their time. They're going, nobody's realizing they're going over their time, but they're realizing how everybody else is going over their own time, right? So, so I don't really know how we would address it, but that starts to create um, an atmosphere of of poor energy you know it's a little snarky and favoritism a little yeah. combative it gets like with the people that are speaking they develop a it's not communal it is mm -hmm. not you know open <clears throat> to you know constructive thought it starts to become something a little in the weeds and i, I don't quite know i don't know the solution to get in front of that but it, it happens every single time we have one of these meetings mm -hmm. yeah. denise Kathy, I do remember that specific, I won't say who did that, who was flailing around, it's pretty ridiculous. And that was in response to one of our select board talking. And so I think Annalie and I, did, we did have a conversation about that. And so I think it's really important if it's someone, if some, it, you know, for instance, the select board was talking about the 50, 50, like 50 foot, I, I forget what they were, frontage. the frontage, yeah. maybe they were re presenting that. So I think next time, I think Annalie said that you would then say, if someone is presenting, they get more than two minutes. And then that, mm -hmm. that takes care of that. Right, the clarifying things, right. be really clear, be really clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, that, and part of the introduction could be that if there are questions or misinformation, we will mm -hmm. try to address that in our deliberations. And if someone flails around, it's on t tape and people see how ridiculous they look. So. Okay. How about, all right, cool. Let's I wish we had this during Dollar General. That's what I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah. that was, <laughs> Those were, that was painful. Sure. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Annalie, you're yeah. muted. Something. <laughs> Keep my hands away. Yeah. Um, Kathy's question about, um, you know, this deluge of, um, really important stuff that is coming at us. And we also saw that in the, well, this is a whole nother issue, but um, I mean, there is, we have the opportunity to just say no. Um, we also want to be responsive. We want to be receptive. Mm -hmm. So let's, can we have a little bit of conversation about that? Because I mean, I, I think that it ties into a number of things that there's been such a flurry of activity it also ties into the, the fact that we mentioned a little bit earlier of how can we really have some thoughtful understanding of the nuances of some of these more complex things when they are boom, 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 you know, happening. Here's, here we're meeting on Friday night so we can have a, yeah. a public hearing on Tuesday or something like that or post it. Yeah, so what are your thoughts about that? Um, well, Denise and then Andrea. Yeah, you know, once, once again. Well, I, th I think a big part of that is is communication. I think that you know a lot of us might. I don't know what's going on with a lot of other other committees, 
maybe this is the time to talk, you know, to just briefly talk about CCIs. Yeah, we'll put that at the end. Okay, but, but anyway, so I think that is going to be a vehicle to help with that. Because, you know, if, if there's so many different things going on at once, then maybe, you know, we would have, if everyone knew, we would have be able to prioritize a little better, not just us, but the select board, everybody. And I know some of it is just going to happen. I mean, we just have, you know, as Rachel said before, we, you know, I've said I'd like to be more proactive, but, you know, we're a combination of proactive and reactive. And some things we just can't help. Andrew, thank you, Denise. I was going to say a lot of the um, meatiness was about, was around the solar um, issues, which clearly was um, carefully thought through because we pulled out the small uh, um, uh, solar in install in installations from the rest of the, um, uh, the the regular town meeting. You know, we said that we would we would spend more time. You know, just dis just uh, really discern what was necessary for it small and 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 that took a lot, a lot, a lot of deliberation. No question. So I think we um, actually should pat ourselves on the back because that was a huge undertaking and it got pulled off from something else. And I think, and I hope that it made people in town look uh, to how serious the planning board is about making good plans. That was um, proactive, that was not just reactive. So that was one. The, um, the other uh, two things were, you know, the, um, the, um, overlay tourist tourism overlay uh, stuff, and that had nothing to do with us. We just we had to um, mm. wait, we had to weigh in uh, for the, the from the select board. Isn't that am I I'm correct about that? I believe no. If we had said no, it wouldn't it would have gone forward, but it would have gone forward without our endorsement. That would have been very tricky for them. So it really did come. It does come from us. I mean, that's the okay. tricky part of this is that we're the planning board. So they're asking us to make a plan. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like that was the one that I, I think we all need to kind of go back and look at it, make sure that we, we feel really good about all the little, like the, mm -hmm. the provision for overriding mm -hmm. our formula-based bylaw. Uh, that mm -hmm. was, that what just sneaked up and bit me in the butt. And I, feel like I don't want to get caught off guard like that again. I felt very caught off guard by that. Yes. Um, that, that, that was, was not very, initiated. It was 11. It wasn't initiated by us, nor, nor did it come to us in a very, I mean, I appreciate, you know, but it didn't come to us in very well hatched. It was kind of hatching and uh, we were part of the hatching, but we weren't really part of the hatching. You know, we were, we were getting it in bits and pieces. And so I think that's one of the things where we're, we need to just push the issue more and say, no, we need to be more and more a part of it. And, and we were, I, I, I don't think it was anything terrible, but I don't think it was great either. And I think we have to keep looking at it. So that, is that <coughs> possibly where, especially if someone else is hatching the bylaw and bringing it to us, one of the things I was thinking of is, could we, if we're able to do it, you know, have a quick sort of third party review by for cog or a consultant i mean yeah. um mm -hmm. who someone else who is gonna take a strong look and just okay here's the main points guys mm -hmm. and and hopefully that won't slow things up too much i don't know that be of help Rachel's I think that's super in. smart. I think that's one of the reasons why it's nice. I mean, I think back to the days of Pat Smith, quite honestly, you know, Pat would look at it and then say, oh gosh, here are the things that I'm concerned about. Um, and here's where you want to watch out. And this is where I saw this in Athol, whatever. Um, so I, I do think we don't have that person per se. Um, Jen's super helpful, but she's also not really our person. She's really the select board person. Mm -hmm. Kathy, thank you, Rachel. Well, I also think, you know, so we had the solar, the frontage, the annual town meeting, which lent itself to the special town meeting because some the frontage didn't really pass in, in the annual town meeting. And then we had the tourism overlay and it was like this massive, it, that's how it felt to me. Like I was building the plane. Oh yeah, plane, fire hose. <laughs> so, so that being said, um, you know, the question is, 
what did we miss something? Could we miss something? Do we have to have another look? Does another board's um, agenda need to affect our expeditious response, right? Like um, the select board or the finance board. So I was looking at some of the other legal notices that have gone in for local towns and it, it made me kind of think about this. So the tourism overlay, and we think about crafts. So the first thing I'm thinking about is crafty crafts. And then I'm like, no, it's not really that kind of craft, although it could be. It's wine craft, it's beer crafts, it's these kind of crafts. I'm like, hmm, that lends itself into another territory. But then like marijuana growing, that's a craft. The edibles are a craft. This is a whole nother craft. Like, so where does this go? And where, what are we saying? Yep, we're putting our stamp on it. We're agreeing with this. We're approving of this. We're accepting of this. So I think, you know, back to what Rachel said, maybe we need to take another look over at that tourism overlay district and think about what does this mean and how do we look at the establishments, you know, and the implication of what we're agreeing to, I guess, collectively, not just any one thing in particular. You know? I'll say as an aside that um, there have been a number of people who have brought forward those concerns about some of the specifics with the tourism overlay. And so <clears throat> um, uh, Chris Curtis is um, going to, um, has gone through with some questions for Lisa Mead. Lisa's gonna look at it more carefully and bring things back to us. So I think specifically about tourism overlay, that mm -hmm. might be something that we might have some tweaks for yeah. the next town meeting. But in general, back to the whole fire hose thing, yeah. And what Rachel was saying earlier of, you know, when someone else brings something to us and it feels, I mean, even doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be as long as tourism overlay. I mean, um, the municipal frontage or even formula-based business. I mean, those are small changes that could have big implications. If we feel like, wow, this could have far reaching effects and we really need to study it quite carefully um we could as we were just saying maybe get a third party review to kind of look at it and maybe given what the third party review says we might come back and say uh the planning board cannot be for or against it right now or i mean no i don't know you know i don't know what our verbiage would be abstain board has no comp yeah sustain or whatever yeah right because uh, we would like to have an opportunity to study it more. I mean, it might not be the way to make friends and influence people, but maybe it is a way. Yes, Denise. My understanding with the um, with the tourism overlay that it was mostly for the three breweries for Treehouse, for Berkshire Brew, and also for Powder Hollow, and that a lot of that language. I think maybe it was just poorly written. But I did ask for clarification because I, I had a conversation with a planning uh, a select board member and said we were a little concerned about that. Um, and I think the reason why we had to, if we didn't address that, I think it would have um, prevented Treehouse from moving forward with their plans. If we didn't do that at the special town meeting, it would have hampered their plans until the next town meeting. That's well, my I don't, and I, But I don't know how much that would have been a real problem or not. It, I don't it, it would have well, been a problem. <laughs> I think that, that we also might have shown favoritism because it looks, because I believe the select board approved uh, entertainment at Treehouse. And I don't know if they had um, approved entertainment at the other breweries. So I think it was also to sort of make the pl playing field more even. Well, again, stepping back maybe from Treehouse versus the breweries, I, although there is the question of, is this spot zoning? That certainly came forward as a question. Um, the whole question of if there's um, a pretty complex issue, how can we, um, how do we want, uh, maybe it's just something we think about 
the next time it comes up. I mean, also there's the whole question is that I'm seeing some nods with that. Um, the question of, um, I, and I think about this, you know, for myself as well, for all of us, it, there were numerous errors in postings in numbers in maps and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, inconsistencies between one section and another and numerous people who did not catch that. So it certainly is not just us. I mean, the select board, the finance committee, the you know, town council, the zoning board. I mean, numerous, I'd say in some of those cases, 20, 30 people who looked at these things and it wasn't until finally at the end, oh my gosh, the map is wrong. <laughs> so I don't know what we ourselves can do about more careful reading of these things, but I guess I just want to make a note of that and it was a yep. concern. Yeah question yeah kathy sylvester um i just going back over the tourism overlay the rush sounds from what you're saying denise had to do with you know trying to help further the business opportunity of treehouse without getting in their way but I, my question would be could they not have gotten like a year permit for whatever until we had time to digest and really understand what it was we were approving i mean would that have hampered them that much i don't know kathy just that was my understanding i don't know whether that's the actual truth and i don't want to miss i don't want to speak out of it. yeah i hear you that's but we could have if things came up with any of the breweries over the year we could have approved as they went along until we were able to digest that whole piece i i felt like it was drinking out of a fire hose, and I think we missed some things. Mm -hmm. I suspect. Rachel? And the bottom line is, it's going to come to us. I mean, that's where we have to, it's, it's we have to prep ourselves sure. for what comes to us. So we have to be versed in it, not the select board. They don't have to be versed in it as much as we do, because we're the ones that are going to meet the disgruntled or the, you know, whatever, the proposals as they come through. So that's important. And that's why at this point we really have to go through it again because we really need to be ready yes. so that we won't be reactive again. Because we were actually explaining it to the public when I was like, this is not even our proposal, although I guess it really is, but yeah. it didn't feel like it was ours. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel prepared to explain it. Mm -hmm. right. Kathy, with Robo, and it's then Denise. Little, it's a little bit back to the original question, right? How do we slow it down when we know we're in a moment of like overload and it, in it, I will tell you for me personally, it's difficult for me to not be well-versed in what it is I'm talking about and presenting and saying yes or no to, I mean, we even, I even got caught in that with the solar vote. And I was like, wait a minute, what does this mean? What? And it's, you're on the spot and, and there's this, idea that we should know because we're on the planning board so we should know right i actually wasn't that comfortable and i was thinking but wait a minute what does yes mean and what does no mean and so i have to stop in the middle of this and ask it because i didn't feel like i had enough conversation um to formulate a good solid perspective and I think part of that is is due to time, and part of it is due to volume. And like, how do we mitigate that? And and do we mitigate it by saying no? I know you need planning board, finance board, zoning board. I know you need to have your notification in the paper by two weeks, but we don't have that. We need more time than that. I mean, is it okay for us to be able to do that and maintain a partnership with these boards? Because quite frankly, the hip bone's connected to the leg bone and we're all interrelated in, in some fashion. I know, yeah, good point, Kathy. Yes, Denise. You know, I, I don't know that we can slow things down, but we can ask to be included in the loop sooner rather than later. I think that's the issue. And I think that we can work towards that. To yeah, yeah. And we'll get back to that in just a minute, Denise, because that's good. Um, is are there any? Did it, does anybody have any other sort of uh, of their sort of forest rather than the trees um, thoughts about <clears throat> about what maybe went well, but or so what we can you know might want to 
think about a little bit more for the next one. <clears throat> Could I Andrea maybe? No? Well, I just, I was gonna say, I was, um, I was pleased to see that we were open to having an amendment to the solar that increased the amount. Kathy was very happy. I was sitting near her. She was very happy. Mm -hmm. But, and we, and we um, didn't fight. We, you know, we, we came up with a solution that we thought was, that was workable. We didn't all, it wasn't unanimous, but we, but we um, did pass it. And then when the public said, <clears throat> I'd like you to reconsider, how about this way? I think we all said, you know, or many of us said, yes. So we, we will listen to um, the public. We had reasons of our own. We talked about that for long periods of time at, um, at our meeting, but we are open to, um, to making changes if it, uh, if it makes sense to the, um, to the public. Right. Thanks, I didn't Andrew. plant him there either. <laughs> Although I thought to myself, boy, I should have done that. <laughs> but, but it was perfect because my biggest concern was that people weren't ready. Uh -huh. and were. Yeah. And they were. You no, know, and and it's going to be. It's gonna. We're gonna have our first. You know, we won't even have to worry about it. It's all gonna be on Bob. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> right, any other any other thoughts? Though? I really have appreciated this conversation. I know okay. it seems well, like we're a, a, an intimate meeting, but obviously other people can be watching our meeting. Mm -hmm. so, well, so, yeah. Always a reminder. <laughs> yeah. Which I think reminder. on Zoom sometimes I think, oh, it's just us, but it's not really. Right. And um, we do want to have the public engagement. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I think this is very really helpful. Let's see, old business, um, just a notion, uh, notation, and this is for me a little bit of a stickler, but as you recall, again, in the scurry of activities beforehand, when um, the select board came to us with a site plan review application for the church renovations on 71 Main Street, they um, hadn't really completed the application, and we asked for the condition um, that they write down their request of the waiver of section 5450. They've not yet done that. So we'll get that in the minutes that that is still pending. Um, and also uh, jumping to another bullet in old business, um, in our solar installation, in our solar bylaws, we do ask for medium and large scale solar ins installments to give us an annual review um, of their operations. It's due 45 days after J January 1st. And um, uh, the town has had an enormous amount of difficulty, um, even just tracking down who the current owners are for the large scale solar. And that in fact, it turns out that um, as they kind of gave an after the fact uh, reports for 20, 2020 and 2020, mm -hmm. 2019, I think it was, um, there um, is one, um, deficiency, if you will, very minor, very minor, but it's been the same deficiency both years. And so there's a big question is who, who has enforcement responsibility? Mm. Um, and everybody's kind of going, Ooh, they do. So um, we're trying to check that out. So that'll go in the minutes also. And again, this is almost being proactive. It really is minor in relation to the solar installations now, but this was the out one there, out on Woman Hill. Yes, correct. Correct. Um, our, another old business piece is, is kind of twofold. Our meeting format for our um, December 1st meeting, we are still on a, um, on a sort of a meeting by meeting determination if we're gonna be hybrid remote or in, in person. Um, there's also a question I think of whether or not we will be having additional working meetings. Um, except, uh, December 6th, as uh, Linda mentioned tonight, the uh, two members of the planning division of FERCOG are coming to talk about kind of the myriad of um, housing issues that are before towns in Franklin County. Um, and for us, a question of kind of how might we crack that nut with, you know, accessory dwellings and condos and tiny houses. In fact, they're just recently, just this last month, there was an issue with a tiny house and um, so, and uh, I sent out to you today too, our, our sort of our <laughs> beginning laundry list of all the things we'd like to do. And so whether or not in November or December, we might want to have an additional sort of working meeting, not even talking about whether or not it 
is posted, it's executive, you know, whatever. We won't even worry about that. Just another, a different meeting. Um, Chris, Chris Curtis has also asked, he is the point person with this um, Municipal Vulnerability Project MVP grant that Linda was talking so strongly about today. And um, it does turn out, I've been attending those meetings, and it turns out that for the uh, uh, green infrastructure as well as MVP, there's a lot of overlay between what the grant calls for and what planning board then might need to do with zoning bylaws. And so Chris has asked if he could come and talk with us some about just what some of those overlay things are. That's gonna probably just add more to our questionable to-do list. So I don't know what you feel about, of course, November and December aren't exactly times to um, <laughs> throw in a new meeting, but thoughts? Hmm. Andrea, uh, who is muted? Andrea, who is muted? Sorry, I have um, one thought about the hybrid versus remote, <laughs> at uh -huh. least. Given that Alex suggested we wait at least one more month while they test, uh -huh. I would say um, make the December 6th meeting remote. That's what I would, that's what I would suggest. We had talked about having a um, kind of a working meeting prior to that for updating the Binder. We could also do that in January. I mean, and 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 I think that that I think needs to be in person. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. yeah, but I think you're you have a good point, Andrea. Other people talk, thought about that for the December meeting. I mean, certainly Burkhog could be Zoom. Right. And the yeah. last thing is that um to, uh, that working meeting uh, to work on our binder. Don't we need Jen for that? And how is she doing? And she's she's coming back. She'll be probably coming back a little bit at a time and not full time. And yeah, she did say before she, you know, went out that um, to have the working meeting because the attorney general did approve all the bylaws so we can make that switch. That's, I don't know, when do you want to have the working meeting? No. Well, we had talked, I had talked with Jen a while ago because I, I, maybe she didn't even have her surgery scheduled at that point. And she had said that she could do it on the 6th, but you know, we could either do it in then or we could do it in January too. Okay. So, I mean, I think the idea of having our next, <clears throat> our next meeting, whatever it is, if it's the sixth or prior to that being remote makes sense as Andrea was saying, if mm -hmm. they're <laughs> proposing that. That's why I asked Alex. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Going. So our next meeting, no matter, exactly what the date is will be remote, not hybrid, correct? Yes. Got it, okay. And then um, what do you think about trying to have a meeting? I mean, again, it seems like we need Chris to come to talk about MVP. We need FERCOG to come and talk about kind of all the housing issues. And then we sit down and look at kind of all of our big list and sort of figure out, you know, what are the, things big and small that we might want to tackle. Yes, Kathy Sylvester? Well, I'd rather have two meetings in November than December if, is my, if we're going to have two meetings. It's my opinion. But okay. For, yeah, just gets worse as the holiday season goes forward. Right, okay. Any, any other thoughts? I mean, People are thinking, oh, slip my throat, I, another meeting. I'd rather do more in November too, just. Yeah. <laughs> I've got, I mean. Yeah, I would agree. I'm, I'm, I'm not available on, on December 6th and so already, so. So why don't we have one on November 15th and that's two weeks from now and then it's two weeks before the, or December 6th. So it's right in the middle. How does that sound? I'm on call again, but I can do the same thing I'm doing now. But yeah. maybe in person for this, or what is that? Uh, I think that that would be remote, yeah. as Alex was, okay. you know, su suggesting that it's not. Rachel, did you know? No, you just. <laughs> no, that's good. I mean, it, okay. as long as I'm, I'm good either way. But maybe like what I'll do is see if um, <clears throat> Furcog is. I mean, it. Whew, it may well be that. 
um, in order for us to really figure out what some of these um, priorities are, we need FERCOG and the MVP stuff to be part of our uh, memory, <laughs> our, our work before. So I'll see if they can come earlier on the 15th. Okay. And we'll figure it out. Okay, cool. Thank you. I think that's helpful. And then in the meantime, too, I can. I think some of the things on that list we certainly found are not necessarily um, things that the planning board would necessarily be working on, like a lot of it with um, updating applications and updating forms and whatnot. I can <laughs> say, welcome back, Jen. <laughs> when can we do this? All righty. Um, uh, let's see. Is, I don't believe there's any other business reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior. Let me have reports of committees and then and then we can do public comments. Um, Denise on CCI. Okay, I'll be very brief. I don't know if you're all aware, but there is a new committee, but it's, it's called Connecting Community Initiative. And it's basically the idea of the committee is better communication, better collaboration and innovation. And what it's going to be, it's, it's an umbrella committee that's going to be over all the other committees and boards, which they're approximately like, I don't know, 2022. And uh, it has absolutely no power over anybody. All it is, is a committee to convene all the other committees. <laughs> Not every single one. We have people from who will be re representing multiple committees so that we have fewer people and I'm going to be chairing the committee, <laughs> um, which is going to be a lot of fun, actually. But I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to, you know, we were talking before about, you know, it's being more proactive instead of reactive. And I know, Kathy, you were saying, you know, being inundated with all these different projects at once. This, at least we will know what projects are on the table from every single committee that exists. And it's going to be probably once a month, I, you know, our first charge is to have their first meeting to people report on what they're doing, what the projects are, what the timeline is, and, you know, are there any issues? And also to see if there are any, there's overlap. There's an overlap of, among a bunch of different committees. So to start making the connections so that I think, you know, to ultimately come up with um, sort of a, a plan for the town that is agreeable by mostly everyone. Of course, no one's ever going to agree. No, everyone's never going to agree. But um, because in January there is a mass, oh, I forget what it is. It's 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 a, a conference in Boston, and it's basically going around and shopping and talking to people about supporting us financially, supporting projects. You can't support a project if you don't know what it is. So the idea is to get sort of a gel gelled idea of how we're going to move forward in the town of Deerfield. So that's it. That's right. the first goal. There'll be multiple goals and a lot of conversation. And it's going to be, Annalie is going to be the timekeeper. <laughs> right, Annalie? Is there, are there departments are there too, right? So oh. it's not just committees, but also police, fire. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it is, um, let's see, we'll have the finance, we'll have someone from the finance committee, community center, senior center, town common committee, planning board, senior housing, capital improvements, conservation commission, CPC, ZBA, senior center, oversight board, library, recreation, cultural council, energy resources, open space and park and the schools. So they'll all be there and you know, if we're going to run it the same way, you know, you've got two minutes to speak, it may be three minutes, maybe some meetings, um, you know, one or two committees will be highlighted because it's more complex what they have to say. That's essentially what it's going to be. But I think it's really moving forward. And people are pretty excited about it. And I think we'll have a lot better communication. And hopefully we won't have everything just dumped on us because we'll know what to expect. That's great. And we'll be able to maybe compromise a little bit more on our workload. That's, good. That's the hope. Right. That's it. Um, I don't think we have any public here for public comments, do we? Oh, a Andrew, did you want something? Sorry. Uh, uh, I wanted to speak uh, to the Open Space Committee. I wanted you to know that the survey is uh, pretty much finalized. 
VRCOG uh, is creating this, it's going to be both a survey monkey and it's going to be um, on paper for people who don't want to do this online. It will be going into the field in the next uh, week or so. I believe postcards will be, we're not sure if postcards will be mailed, but somehow um, people throughout town will be informed and there will be several places to drop off surveys if you want to do them on paper. And uh, one other committee member and I are going to be handing them out at the transfer station or, or at least reminding people that, the, um, that this can be done online or hand them a, a piece of paper. So the hope is that the survey will close by about mid-December. And with that information, we'll be able to go forward, um, you know, to approach the state if we wanted to get uh, funding for something and allow us to uh, establish priorities and goals for Open Space Rec Recreation Committee. Great. Wonderful. Oh, great. All right. Um, we did see mail. I thought it was interesting of the mail that we had. Um, they, it has to do primarily with marijuana, retail establishment, solar installation, accessory apartments, marijuana cultivation. So that's all stuff that we're working on too. So we're just part of the group. <laughs> okay. Um, so our next meeting is uh, November 15th, uh, 7 p.m. remote. Uh, possibly with FERCOG and MVP and, you know, uh, we can even, we, we will fill the time. That won't be a problem. <laughs> so um, that's it. I guess I'll take a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> ah, excellent, Denise. I, I needed Second. to do it before Rachel. Second, I know. I, I, All sorry. right. I'm happy for the speed. All right. Hey, we, we try to keep to it. Okay. And I think all in favor, we can all uh, put our hands up. There we go. Unanimous, Rachel, for the minutes. All right. Alex, thank you for your help tonight. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Um,